the big ghost tank. We'll keep you in the know. In the big ghost tank. We'll fix your techie woes. And we'll break things. And we'll make things. Till we're all together raking. And we'll raise a cup of grog down in the big ghost tank. In the big ghost tank. We'll come and join us. And we'll fire up the big ghost tank. In the big ghost tank. We'll raise a cup of grog down in the big ghost tank. In the big ghost tank. We'll come and join our fire crew. In the big ghost tank. We'll show you what to do. And we'll hack it till we crack it. And we'll tell the world about it. And forget to tidy up. That's why it's now a bilge tank. Hello and welcome to episode 095 of the Bilge Tank from Sheffield on Sea. I'm here with <laughs> Phil and a rare occasion Nico hey. is in the house, our head engineer. Most of the crew, well half the crew are off in Berlin, the make fair. Um, and they landed yesterday so I guess they're going to start setting up our stall and kind of getting ready for the chaos of the weekend. Uh, we have a special Bilge Tank today with a new product and a small selection of Adafruit products as well which we've just brought in and pretty cool. Um, but first of all, let's talk about Hyperpixel. It's hyper. It is it's super got hyper. Pixels. Um, do you want to go on to the close-up part? Yes. Blue. Um, so there's already quite a few LCD displays that plug into the Raspberry Pi GPIO, but they almost exclusively use the SPI interface, um, which really means cool. they have quite limited bandwidth. They tend to be reasonably low resolution, and often the frame rate suffers as well. The main benefit of using SPI is that obviously you've got the rest of the GPIO available, which is useful if you need that. If you need it. Yeah. But this screen uses the DPI interface, which is like a, a much higher speed parallel interface. DPI is basically use all the pins. Effectively, yeah. I think this is we've got it set up as 18 bit. Yeah. Because there's a yeah. few different DPIO modes that you can use. Uh, an 18 bit gives you six bits per channel, so red, green, and blue, which effectively means 18 GPIO pins are used just for blatting <laughs> video data. Um, the benefit being that you can get a higher resolution and a better frame rate, which is pretty awesome, really. Nice. Yeah, it is nice. So what is this? this is 800 by 480 pixels, which is the uh, same resolution as the official Pi touchscreen, which is a heck of a resolution to have on a small screen like this. It's yeah. Nice. It's, it's about the minimum usable resolution you can comfortably get away with using a desktop on in Linux, while technically the... The, the official minimum, I think, is 102, 4 by 7, 6, 8. You can mm -hmm. get away with 800 by 480. This uses, uh, yeah, the display is effectively 270 pixels per inch, which is super, basically super high res for that <coughs> size. All the PPIs. So if you don't need um, loads of GPIO, but you just want a really good high quality image, or uh, you want to play um, like 60 frames a second video or something like that, it's perfect or for that games. kind of use. Or games. Games, games emulation. Um, obviously, if you're doing things like retro emulation, you can still use the USB ports for controllers and stuff like that. So you Quite. don't necessarily need the GPIO for your inputs and stuff, which is cool. Uh, people are asking if we've got a case that works with it. You can use mm -hmm. the existing PIBO with a single height extension layer, I believe. We should have brought one of those in. Didn't think of that. Um, but basically, if you get a full-size PIBO, and if you buy the uh, height extension layer, then put all of that together and it should fit in nicely. A key is really dodgy on this keyboard. The A key? A key. You got the dodgy A key? This is just the keyboard that pulled out. From... Is it your A key Ooh. breaky heart? <laughs> a, a key. <laughs> uh, I've got a few um, Python demos that I wrote originally for the, the Pi touchscreen, the official touchscreen, but they work pretty much out of the box. Oh, Paul's in chat! Well. Woo! Live from Boiling. Hi, hi, Boiling Paul. Is there uh, Boiling anyone else around? So this is a simple paint demo, so I can show you. Go. Look at that. Oh. How close can we get in on that? Oh, so it's you can really see weird. The Looking at my delayed finger. Let's have a look. Whoa. Oh, oh. Look how tiny they are. Yeah, you can definitely see a bit of stepping. Let's see, because well, there's no anti aliasing sort of thing. It is insane for a screen of that size, though, isn't it? It is. Really nice. I'm going to hit ESC to quit and then I'm going to load something else up. Just go back to the got? main camera for a second, Nico. So, in the package, you'll get a uh, bubble bag to protect the screen, obviously, and then everything comes inside an ESD bag. The Hyperpixel itself comes fully assembled, so there's nothing you need to do at all. We've already stuck the screen down. We've got, we've got a nice jig down in production so that the screen's always gone perfectly. Um, and we, we, you know, obviously assemble the table, cables, do all the tests and everything. But also inside the bag we've included um, a couple of extra pieces just to make life a bit easier. Which includes a small extension header, so that means that it'll sit above the um, Ethernet port on the Raspberry Pi. Do you want to show this one close up, actually, Phil? I'll put this header on. Oh, have you got one? You've got, got one. one. Let's go close up. Go close so up. So normally, 
uh, a board of this size, which is what we're calling a wide hat or a watt. What? Watt. Watt. Um, wouldn't be able to sit flush on the pie. So we've got these extended headers that basically lift the board up. That's upside down, Phil. All the bits are going to fall out. Fine. There you go. Um, so you can see it just raises it up enough. And then also in the kit, we've included a rubber foot as well, which sits on the Ethernet port. Have you got one that's I on yours? Have, or have you not attached bothered? a square rubber foot, which yeah, there you go. is not the one. It is the, the one. Kit, it's the very one. So there's a small rubber foot there as well, and that just sits it on top of the Ethernet port, makes sure it sits perfectly flat. And then as well, which I don't think you have, there's what a. Do I have? There's a, a small bolt and nut, which you can I mount. I don't have the, a bolt and nut. You can mount that in this corner. You can have a bolt and a nut. I meant in that corner and that just props up the Just exactly the right bolt. lane. <laughs> there you go. That's well, you can snip the bolt, it's nylon. Uh, so you can basically get it to your level, uh, snip it down, tie it on. But it just means that the, the display can be super stable on top of the pie, ah, which is very useful. And this is not the recommended way of assembling it. Well, watching <laughs> while watching your giant hands on a huge screen. A huge screen that's got a slight delay as well. Right, so have we got any questions? Hooray, Phil is back. I knew you had to ban out there, Phil. I knew it. A fan! A Woo! fan! Uh, you can run it off a zero. So this is the cool thing, because instead of mounting an extended header on the board itself, we decided to use the um, separate expansion header because it means you can mount it really flush to a Raspberry Pi Zero. So you can make super, super tiny kind of portable screen, wire, well, effectively a wireless screen with multi-touch, it's only two-point multi-touch, but with multi-touch control. This would be good for a conference badge or something. <laughs> but you can just say, poke me or something on the poke screen, me. and Literally poke them, poke and it me. does something. Oh, Phil's playing. Can we do that two-player bomb? Bomb. It is technically... What, what is it doing? What are you doing, Phil? Am I looking at the delay on the screen? Yeah, the screen's horribly delayed. So there delayed. you go. Boink. I like two fingers in there. Uh, power draw, Nico. The mm -hmm. hyperpixel. Mm -hmm. uh, the backlight takes about 110 milliamps, so the screen takes actually less than that. Yeah. I think 150 that. combined. Roughly. Yeah. yeah, something like that. So on a zero, you're probably looking in total at about three to 400 milliamps with the zero as yeah. well. Yeah, it's quite. It's and quite the backlight, decent. you can also dim it. Uh, yes. To make the current much lower. Mm -hmm. um, you, you effectively you put a backlight driver circuit on here, and you've tied it to the PWM pin on the Raspberry Pi, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can use hardware PWM to control the backlight. A lot of these displays seem to control the brightness through the LCD rather than the backlight yeah, itself. Yeah, which is the wrong way of doing it, of course. And what that means is that when you when you knock something back to black, you, st you basically you end up with like grey, basically, <laughs> because the backlight is just forcing its way through the um, the turned off pixels. I've been having Whereas some fun with the backlight. With this, you have full control over the brightness of the backlight, so you're actually adjusting the LEDs themselves rather than just masking them with the, the LCD display, effectively. Which makes it great if you want to install it in uh, a lower light setup, you can really knock the back, backlight back a bit uh, and still have the full uh, range of colour, but not the kind of the glare coming into it. Do you want to show the zero? Zero. Super slim, man. Right, let's see if I can get this the right way up this time. Is that the right way? No, it's the wrong way. Oh, 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 oh. It's close oh, enough. Oh, 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 oh. Hey. So, dead easy to put on there. Phil's working on... You've already got kind of a way to install this and set it up, which is a little complex, but we're, we're working, working on, on a one-line installer, installer. Right now. So In fact, Rogue is next door, presumably he's hammering he's away at it. Literally bundling everything together and questioning every every instruction that I've written. Yeah. You're a fool, Phil! Why did you do that? What are you doing? Um, as well, as you can see here, it's also got two-point multi-touch, so Phil can control uh, these two kind of like virtual analog sticks on the screen mm -hmm. at the same time. Woo. Um, which makes it really cool for kind of interfaces, um, uh, scrubbing video right. and things like that. With a custom video player and a good size kind of scrubber bar at the bottom, it would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, a, sorry for a usable, complete desktop all oh, yeah, in three and a half inches. actually can use the desktop on here. There's more nonsense user interface stuff that I've written for that I can't. Oh, there. This is like a touch library you wrote in Python, right? <laughs> yeah, I wrote so this for the, the official touch screen because I've... I couldn't find anything other than Kivi that did kind of multi-point touch in mm -hmm. Python. So I wrote my own multi-point touch library just for making interesting interfaces and stuff like this. And nobody ever used it. It just sat there on GitHub until it's time to shine. But it's, it's kind of cool. It's like a kind of retro-futuristic, which makes no sense at all. Yeah. But it's like, 
You'd expect to see something like that in Blade Runner or something. Oh, it's kind cool. of cool. Uh, and obviously you can then put the effort into kind of skim the graphics yourself, write your own drawing routines, close yeah, controls yeah. or whatever. So and it's a good way to pretty. create basic interfaces. Uh, well, uh, it's um, actually reasonably usable despite its size. You'll have trouble hitting things like the minimize and maximize buttons and this already is pushing a non-touch OS to the limits that you can get away with with touching. So if I go Of a screen that size, internet, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's Chromium web browser. Welcome to Claw's Mail. Okay, that pretty much shows that my fingers are too fat. <laughs> Bunk. <laughs> <laughs> no, what have you done? Because it is capacitive touch, you can use the kind of tablet pens one, that one. you get with the capacitive touch doohickeys on. Oh, oh God, such a nice screen. It's so it nice. All to be you. forgiven. Uh, this does have multi-touch on it. We are looking at doing a version that doesn't have any touch layer at all, um, but we're still working on that. Mm. So it's, it's not available yet. We're not quite sure what the situation will be uh, until we get there. But look at that. Super smooth. Mm. Lovely. It's, it's um, surprisingly good colour considering it's only 18-bit, but I guess 18-bit is many bits. That's still... How many colours is that? It's 220-odd thousand colours, isn't it? 262,144. So it's plenty um, you're of colours. Only, you're only going to see any issues with it when you're looking at like rainbow images where you get banding. Should we have a quick look at the tablet? Because uh, this great site called pinout.xyz has a description <laughs> of the DPI interface. Now this is not actually the pinout that this particular display is using. This is one of the possible options you can use with the uh, DPI interface, which I didn't realise at the time this layout was created. Yeah, effectively the Pi supports something like six different DPI layouts that have different bit depths per pixel and different arrangement of the pins yeah. that are in use yeah. effectively. And this is the same stuff that the, the classic VGA 666 used, uh, which was the, I think, Gert's product that does analog VGA out from a little Raspberry Pi GPIO add-on. Um, and all that has is like a resistor ladder that effectively take the DPI signals and turn them into an analog signal that becomes VGA. Um, but the one we chose was specifically 666 because we needed some extra pins for some extra uh, signals for, for configuring the LCD mm -hmm. and running the touch screen and clock signal for the LCD and many th mm -hmm. things like that. So basically we use every available GPIO pin. All of them. And you some, can't have any. Some of them even have two functions mm -hmm. <laughs> because we run out. There is one possibility for IO expanding and that is that there is a soft I2C bus <coughs> that yeah. we use to configure the... It's the touch yeah, interface, it's the touch right? Yeah, uh, it's the touch interface. So at some point on pinout XYZ we'll get the full hyperpixel pinout, but there is actually uh, an I2C interface which I think is SM bus... Is it number it three? Uh, on the um, Pi driver, is it number three that you talk to? Number to three, touch? it just means it's, it's number the number three, yeah. so soft you're, uh, one. Right, okay. It's and you tell it what pins... Yeah. Clock and data. It's right. magic. Yeah. Yeah. magic. It's truly magic. So effectively, you can put another device on that I squared C bus, say an IO multiplexer or um, a sensor or something like that, if you want yeah, to. I suppose you yeah. could. Which is kind of cool. You're sufficiently mad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I expect. I expect you'll have done it by the end of the day. Then. <laughs> <laughs> We've wanted <laughs> various contrivances. Um, so yeah, that's hyperpixel. There's one other quite interesting thing about the way that we configured it with the six 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 to to make sure we get the full range of colours from 0 all the way up to 255 yeah. and that's to do with how the least significant bits are tied, right? Yeah, so basically the two lowest bits, the two least, least, <laughs> least significant, significant bits are wired to the two most significant bits so that uh, the like the black is the actual black and the white is the actual black, white and, and then in the in the whole range from black to white, you only have three points where you kind of jump over. You have like a, a threshold, like yeah, a transition yeah. across that threshold. You jump over two bits at once, which uh, basically you, you can't see them, so it's, no. it's hmm. pretty smart. Nice. It is quite quite common to tie the least significant bits just straight to ground, which kind of makes sense, but then your range is truncated. You can only go from zero to two by one. Two, two five two, yeah. I think yeah. two five two. Yeah. You only go from naught to two five two instead of naught to two five five. So you lose some of the highest. Uh, yeah, you lose the high end values. values. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. I don't know if there's anything more to say about it. Really? Been having fun with the software. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do tall. Mm -hmm. Tell mm -hmm. about the software, Phil. <laughs> oh, so there is a, a currently a Python driver that runs the touchscreen. 
uh, runs behind the scenes, talks to the I squared C touchscreen controller chip, and uh, just uses uh, EV Dev, which is the same thing we use with Picade Hat to get events from the touchscreen into the underlying system, so you can use them on uh, uh, in your yeah, X desktop. Uh, the backlight has been an interesting challenge because I've got the GPIO backlight up and running use the, using the standard kernel module for it. So you'll see a folder just like you do with the official Raspberry Pi display called Sys Class Backlight, um, RPI Backlight, and you can turn the backlight on and off with that. You, it's essentially like a file, you just write a value to it, don't Indeed, you? Yeah. yeah, and I'm waiting for, or will encourage the maintainers of Raspbian to include a module called PWM Backlight, which Ooh. will give us brightness control of the display. So and that hooks into yeah. like the standard Linux backlight control stuff you'd have in, yeah, in any Linux Yeah, so the, the, all the libraries and examples that were written for the official touchscreen, which give you like Python control of the backlight brightness and other mm -hmm. stuff like that, they'll all work with this as well once we, we get that up and running. Phil, yeah. um, somebody was mentioning on the chat that you can't use the audio when you are using the PWM backlight and backlight, but because we use PWM1 for the backlight, does it uh, mean PWM1 that? PWM1 is also used for audio. It uses the 0 and 1 for the left and right. Oh, channel. okay, okay. Yeah, so you still can't so, yeah, use You so. cannot use analog audio at the same time as PWM backlight, but you can just use the uh, regular cheaper backlight. And can copy it on and you off. use one channel of analog audio? Not really, not without making modifications to the, the driver. audio driver, because it will glom Does onto that them. cheaper. Uh, gotcha. Okay. Um, I haven't experimented yet with enabling audio and forcing output to HDMI and running the backlight driver mm. and seeing what happens because uh, recent changes with uh, Pixel mm -hmm. basically caused weird stuff to happen with uh, Unicorn Hat, which also has a similar problem uh, crashing with the audio. So there's a few other things for, to investigate there to see what's possible. But well, so you can just leave the backlight on full power. Oh yeah, you, you basically you can do nothing with that pin. As Nico points out, the backlight is pulled high by default, so mm. it will just stay on. So you can do nothing with that. Oh, pin so essentially, if you don't if you don't set GPIO or BCM eighteen to it to PWM 19. mode, it's eighteen, isn't it? Nineteen. Oh, because it's PWM nineteen is PWM one. one. Gotcha. So as long as you don't set the mode of that GPIO <laughs> pin, yeah, to PWM. You can still use the audio, but yes. the backlight is just on. Well, in fact, if you set the mode of that pin to PWM, you can use audio, but it will cause weird stuff to happen with your backlight. So you can't really. Use I, it. You would <laughs> modulate the backlight with the audio. With the signal, audio, which could be an interesting thing. Top to tip: observe. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, so that's kind of cool. Very nice. It's Forty pounds, which is, I mean, these kind of screens tend to be roughly that price point. They get the reason we like. This one particularly is the high resolution and high frame rate, which you just can't get through an SPI screen. Effectively, we're pushing about four times pixel data, right, of, uh, of the SPI screen, so just not possible to do it via SPI would, on a Pi. Would one without touch be meaningfully cheaper? Because that could be really, really nice. It, for, like, we, no promises, we expect it to be a bit cheaper, but we're not 100% sure yet. So. We shall it, see. If, if it even comes, we'll find out that it comes. But basically, all you need to do now is stick a Pi cable board to the back of it, run the USB over, put your arcade controls in a little wooden case or mm -hmm. laser cut purse box, and you've got yourself a gaming handheld with a screen that's so good. But kind of cool with the Pi Zero. Interesting, the, so the open Pandora console uses the same resolution of screen, but it's slightly larger than the Zero. Yeah. So 800 by 480 is fairly common. It's uh, pretty cool. We have. Um, couple of other new products coming over the next few weeks as well. So keep watching. It should be, uh, mm. should, should be an interesting month. Thou art teasing. Thou art teasing indeed. Smart. Should we have a look at some Adafruit stuff? Yeah. Let's do it. So in store we have... <laughs> this is one of those situations where we bring in an Adafruit product and then it's basically sold out by the time we get to Bilge Tank. So we've got two of them left. Great. Um, but this is, uh, this is a bit like our shim format boards where I'm going to open this up and have a look. I want to know if they pre-populate that header. I'm not 100% sure whether they do or not. But um, effectively, it's tiny little OLED for your Pi, so it's a great little screen for showing things like the IP address that you currently got. If you're running your Pi headless, that's really irritating, um, not being able to find it on the network. And it does actually come with the header pre-installed, which means that you can't really <laughs> yeah, use it with other stuff. Yeah, haven't really got the idea of shims here. Because um, for... Our, our kind of shim format, the whole idea is that you push that like firmly down onto the GPIO, actually solder it to the GPI, GPIO pins and then still be able to put a hat on top 
as like you an would optional need to drill thing. a hole in your hat to see the screen through. But you wouldn't, because you could like just boot it with that on to see what your IP address is, yeah, and then stick the hat on and get on with it. But it's a cool little kind of status it's thing. It's nice. These OLEDs are just they're really really nice. They're so crisp and delightful. It's monochrome. It only comes in white. Uh, it's 128 by 32 pixels, and there's no grayscaling in that. It's just oh, monochrome. It looks so basically. nice on the Pi Zero. Looks uh, in the in the photo. It's sweet, and they've put at least they've put a header on that allows for a stacking uh, header. Stacking header yeah. So you can get one of the. Yeah, okay. We've just got some new extended stacking headers coming, haven't yeah, we? Do. Yeah. So effectively, you can put uh, mm -hmm. an extended stacking header on the Pi, which then gives you like double height pins off. Put this on, still have pins coming through, but it'll just get a bit tall and uh, wobbly, which is fine. Will it work okay with zero USB stem attached? Yeah, it should be fine. Yes, I did most of my testing and development for high Pixel on the Pi Zero with USB stem attached. As it happens, um, it's quite cool when you plug the screen with high Pixel on into the side of a laptop. Uh, John McCabe was asking about the Pi OLED, not the high Pixel, but, but, but yeah, yeah, both would be thing. fine. Same Any, thing, anything basically. Same difference. So that's kind of cool. You just can't use USB at the same. What is uh, this? It's eighteen pounds. We've only got two left in stock, but we're a suit. we're going to pull some more in, obviously, because we sold through them quite quickly. So we will definitely have more RJ coming. Forty-five gland. So this is a way to what route the? an RJ forty-five cable to a uh, kind of outside environment. Okay. So it's a waterproof, basically. It's a way to okay. secure a cable without allowing Ooh, ingress of water. What's going on here? I'm very scared. Oh, oh, that's. That's pretty good. Okay, it's in there, I see. Yeah, so, it is, uh, so you basically have closer. to run the cable through. Let's get rid of that. Ooh. Yeah, you I think to... you have to crimp your own cable with this, right? Because yeah. you run the cable through <coughs> through this shroud. The, do you know garden hose pipes, right? Where I've heard of them, the yes, Phil. Do yeah. tell me more. Well, I don't have a garden, so <laughs> okay. I assume people don't yeah. know what a hose pipe is unless they've... The, this day and age, everyone lives in tiny, tiny flats. No. So yeah, they have this thing on the end where you crimp the hose pipe in and then you screw it tight and it grips the pipe. This is the same with some sort of rubberized filling, I so, guess. Yeah. yeah. So that's by nature of screwing this screw top over it is gripping the cable. And uh, we should have got creating a waterproof RG, seal. Yeah, effectively. We should have got an RJ forty five cable that actually demonstrated this. But well, you can see the hole in the centre. Yeah. Tightening up basically. You would need to the iris. Okay. You would need to crimp it though yourself because yes. obviously so you can't you put the head of the through, cable through. Then crimp it. Actually, can't you? Uh, can you not? Oh, do you think you might be able to push the grommet out or the rubber ring or whatever it is? Oh, maybe. Okay. Ah. Need an RJ45 cable now. There's one there, that green cable there. It's not RJ45. Where's it going? Oh, it's probably not important. Just pull it out. Where's it going? It's welded to It'll the table. Fine. Okay, here we go. Let's do this. So. You got your little rubber debris what's it here? And that goes over there. Presumably nice. your RJ45 cable, as long as you haven't oh, yeah, broken you the clip off the end, goes like that. You didn't put the other bit on first. Can so I show it Bill, oh. goes on first. Damn curses! Now it won't come out because obviously the RJ45. Let's go. Let's go big close up and okay. uh, put us in the corner. Do -do. There right, you go. Here we go. So collar first, then rubber grommet. I always feel like a meerkat doing bilge tanks, so I'm always staring up at that screen <laughs> and then I catch myself then, down there going Do you what's it? Oh, don't lose your seal. Don't lose arf, your seal. Arf. So this is right. Where did this nice. where was the seal? That was inside there, so there's another seal inside there. So you're, you're you're basically positioning this directly seals. behind doors. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. So that have you tightened up the other bit first? I haven't yet, no. So I'm gonna plug it in first, oh, then I'm see, gonna yeah, screw yeah. that onto there. Okay. Right tighty. Right tighty. Right tighty. Oh, 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 oh. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna give up yeah. screen. Actually the um Okay, I haven't plugged it in. Plugged it in now. Excellent. Then the big rubber bong goes in there. And as John rightfully pointed out, the collar now comes and screws on the back. Magic. <laughs> and the rubber bung falls out because Phil hasn't pushed it in. Push it in all the way, didn't we? Ah, okay. okay. Here it goes. Here it goes. Let's try this again. Don't forget to insert your bung. These kind of things are not kind of classically exciting, but if you need a waterproof seal, they're what you need. Yes, it is just what it is. So they're quite. They tend to be quite kind of clever mechanically, don't right. they? Right. Except I can't push too, my bung too, in because it's too clever rubbery. for Phil. <laughs> 
you need to loosen that up a little bit first, maybe? Possibly. Because yeah. I would have thought you'd tighten that bit up first. Yeah. Like, you know, but then that will close. grip the cable, so this I guess bit so, will yeah. loosen. Maybe I've over tightened that bit. Because I think that's sitting on the back of the Ethernet cable. I think we can all agree it makes for compelling viewing, <laughs> and that's what matters. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Tighten that up a bit first. Okay, and screw this bit. That's really, really tight. Good. I guess that's kind of the point, really, it isn't kind it? kind of the point, yeah. So now, yeah, RJ45 cable is very, very weather sealed. So where's, what, presumably this is then, this, ah, that, you then, ah, you've got another oh, rubber got thing there. Rubber so that's presumably what you mount it onto your, like your, your shed wall or whatever. Yeah. And then put that on and screw that up. And then Someone internally you have a protected waterproof yeah, yeah. Ethernet. That's how you get your Ethernet to your shed. Now you know. Dun. Can't say fairer than that. Uh, and uh, so super useful if that's the kind of thing that you need. Hey. Uh, the next thing up is Sparkfun Redboard. This is effectively uh, an Arduino Uno compatible. So it's based on the same design. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the hardware is identical. I mean. It, Da, 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 da. If you need something to do Arduino stuff on, so it's red. Have the red board, the board, and it's red. So um, we've stocked the inventors kits quite some time that has that included. So apart from do like a big inventors kit, which I think is about seventy pounds, but you get loads of components. You get an uh, instruction booklet with project ideas and things, and you get red board in there. Um, we've just brought in the latest version of the inventors toolkit. And we thought we'd get the bare red boards at the same time this time. Oh, so if you want another red board, you can get another red board. That is the kit that I always, always wanted until I basically outgrew it. And Shall I bring now it up? there's just no point in me having one. Yeah, it is a great kit. Especially if you're getting started with electronics and kind of microcontroller programming. Just because the guide's really good. You know, it, it comes, comes in a nice, nice reusable box. box. Yeah. It comes with a, a acrylic mounting plate for a breadboard and the Arduino compatible mm. itself. All the cables you need, tools you need and various components, LEDs, sensors, that kind of thing, and loads of projects in the book, so very mm. cool. Great mm. great way to get started. And it was Some joke 85 called uh, Paul Beach says, will Hyperpixel work with RetroPie? Well, RetroPie is basically based on Raskin, so yes it will. We will, we will prove it. <laughs> we will prove point. it. That it will work. Okay, and last up is the most exciting we now have Adabox 003 in the house. And I think this was the one they worked with DigiKey on. It says curated by DigiKey, which is essentially a non-statement, I think. I have no idea what, <laughs> what, what to what depth that actually curated means anything. By. But they, the Adaboxes are really, really cool. They nodded when we waved and they stuff at them. Cool. <laughs> it's very slick. Oh! <laughs> 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 you appear to have launched part of it across the room. Could you retrieve the cardboard, Bill? <laughs> this is this is back to the trope of me always going behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> Phil is our fourth wall. <laughs> um, so Ada Box always comes uh, uh, kind of like beautifully presented in this tissue paper. Uh, I feel playing with this like that oh, episode of well. Star Trek where Data gets the Chinese finger trap. It's a Chinese there finger trap. With his fingers caught in it. Thank you. Uh, so Adabox is Adafruit's subscription service. They do one every two months, I think it is, and the subscription oh. is 60 or $70. There's words on that. There is oh, words. Oh, wow, the um, paper is amazing. And after they've fulfilled all the subscriber units, they're then available to buy after the event, but you don't get any batteries, for shipping reasons, I think, and you don't get uh, the little custom pin that they do, like a little badge pin that you get in each kit. So this one, I think, is their IoT kit, which is kind of cool. Oh, they've got a DigiKey <laughs> stroke Adafruit PCB ruler in there. PCB rulers are everywhere. So you get everything that you need to build the projects in the kit, and I think this is Hazar based Yeah, it's uh, ESP8266. So you get an uh, Adafruit Feather ESP8266, then all the other components you need to build the projects that are part of the subscription kit. So that's kind of cool, and we now have it on store. To be honest, if you want to buy these regularly, you're better doing the subscription, because they're quite a lot cheaper. Once they become a product, the price goes up. Uh, I think they kind of they subsidise the kits a bit to do the subscription service, which is very nice of them. And loads of people keep telling us we should do a yeah, pirate box, a booty chest. We should do a pirate, a pirate booty chest. This is kind of cute. Well, we could do it? a limited edition of one. 
<laughs> one, a subscription of one. Yeah, you get one box. Guaranteed, no, no recurring <laughs> payments, no need to cancel, nothing, just one. Yeah. There you go. Brilliant. So this is kind of cool. It's got a motion sensor in there, a servo, humidity temperature sensor. It's got a eighty. Uh, it's got no LED, the same spec as this one. Obviously not in that format. Yeah. The Featherwing version of that. Pretty slick. Uh, you got jumper wires, breadboard, door, oh door closing sensor, vibration sensor, component bag, lipo battery, which you don't get in this. Oh yeah, they don't do the lipos in the, the retail version because they can't ship overseas. But shipping batteries is a nightmare. Um, so they can only do it for domestic customers. And you get the PCB ruler and you get the pin if you subscribe. So subscribe to Adabox. They're awesome. Alex Smith asking all the controversial questions there. What's he asking? He That's basically Skyrider. says he's dun, like dun, dun, a uh, fat-sized um, black Skywriter. He'd like a Skywriter that's fat-sized in black? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> Could happen, you never know. Right, I think... Have tried just sawing yeah. half of a full-sized um, Skywriter hat off? That so would I'm not w would work a bit. <laughs> it would slightly work, not maybe. But not quite. It wouldn't be perfect by any stretch. That would uh, cause terrible things to happen. Right, on that note, I think we're done. Uh, for next Thursday, the Berlin crew should be back, so I think maybe Paul, Tanya and Emma might do a bit of a Berlin up. special. I'm sure they're going to do some video. See how many 3D printers and face scanners they saw? The best thing about Berlin, as far as I heard it, is that they have loads of retro electronics. Yes. Like, like you go to stalls really and it just looks like, like switches out of Russian submarines and just like crazy Every glass Every time Paul comes back things. with tons of retro electronics, it just go nowhere and no. never have anything like One over there. Um, so that should be, it should be a cool episode next week. Um, lots of information about Bill and Maker. So we will see you later. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Ta-da! Bye-bye.